that led him to his theological conclusions. But I think it goes to the heart of what drove him in his obsessive need to tear down everything and rebuild the church in his own tormented image. It is important that Christians of the 21st century understand the Protestant Reformation because we cannot understand the modern world without understanding the Reformation. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. Mother Angelica Live. Brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, welcome, and we missed you last week, but our sisters are on retreat, and that we prayed for you. That's the most important part of our lives, you know? We, we're on television and radio, and, and we, we come off the air into your living room in various ways, but it's the prayers, I think, of the sisters and our general family, see, because we're all family, many hundreds and thousands and millions of us. Our prayers united are very powerful, aren't they, huh? I mean, really powerful. We have wonderful guests here. This a wonderful guests of our family here this evening. Tonight we're going to talk. Well, we'll start out with this, but we don't know how we're going to end up. You see, but he is risen. You really feel sorry for those who don't know that. You say Paul said, if he hasn't risen, our faith is useless. You know, and we know he rose. And he has given us a great gift after that, two great gifts, his Holy Spirit, which transforms us as poor, weak sinners that we are into, the, into that likeness of Jesus. So that our personalities begin to change into the likeness of Jesus. So if we're angry, we become a little bit more gentle. If we're impatient, we become a little more patient. You see, you want to be like Jesus. And even the, the apostles had a hard time with the resurrection. Did you notice that? If you have a problem with faith, you ought to, they may make you feel good. The 21st chapter of John. I'm going to go over this before we talk about the presence of God in our own lives because it does bring out some qualities we need to know that God is in our midst. Now you said, where there are two together, I'm in their midst. Well, look how many here tonight. We know he's in our midst, you know. But if, do, we, do we live by what we know? See, if you knew Jesus was in your midst, you'd never swear. You, you'd never act the way you do sometimes. With Jesus standing right there looking at you. So I, I want you to see this. This is a great, great event here. It's the appearance of our dear Lord on the Sea of Tiberias. So, um, 
this is after the resurrection. This is after the apostles saw the Lord. It's John 21. And um, if I would have seen the Lord after the resurrection, I would have just stuck where, the, where he, I saw him last. If I saw him in the upper room, I'd have stayed there. I mean, I would have just stayed there and prayed because the very resurrected feet of Jesus stood in that spot. People go miles today in bus loads to see a tree that Our Lady stood under or whatever. Isn't that true? The poor children of Fatima, before you knew it, that whole little tree Our Lady stood on was gone. Leaves were gone. The branches were gone. Well, I would have been maybe the same. And I had thought, well, here he was. And this is the place he stood. I'm going to stick her out. You know what the apostle said? We're going fishing. <laughs> fishing? <laughs> I always thought the, the apostles were Italian Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, after such a vet, an event, would you think of your stomach? <laughs> I've got fish. Like, oh. I guess they didn't know what to do, you know? You don't know where he was going to come next and, or be seen next. And well, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into a boat, caught nothing, not even a minnow, which was their usual thing, you know? Did you ever notice that? They never caught any fish on their own. You wonder sometimes how they made a living before Jesus came along. <laughs> so it was light, so they were not all night. It was light now, and there stood Jesus on the shore. But they didn't know it. They didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus called out, said, <coughs> Have you caught anything, friends? I don't know what you would have said. But as a good Italian, I know what I would have said. <laughs> I would have said, I mean, who would want to defeat, admit defeat? You'd say, I didn't go fishing. I went out to meditate. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and now we see a quality we need to be aware of the presence of God. Because you're going to see these men become more and more aware of who it was standing on the shore. See, they didn't know. You and I don't know when Jesus is around. Oh, he never talked to me. Yeah, he does. You just don't want to listen. Your conscience ever bother you when you're starting to do something you shouldn't? Are you going to tell me you don't have a conscience? He talks to you a lot. Maybe you're too busy to listen. So here they are now. They've seen Jesus in the flesh, resurrected. What a glorious sight that must have been, especially after you witnessed such a terrible death. Mm. And uh, Peter says, no. Isn't that simple? He didn't say, well, we tried, didn't excuse himself. Some of us would have said, well, I worked at it. I mean, we've been out all night. We threw that blessed net out 20 times and never caught a thing. We'll try later. No, did no excuses, just no. Ah, now we're getting to a quality we need to see Jesus. To be aware of his presence. And that is honesty. There's hardly anybody honest today. We don't tell outward, outward lies. Somebody say, oh, that's a white lie. What's a white lie? If you lied, you lied. What do you mean it's a white lie? But we don't, we're not um, honest, see. We, we, we try to hide things and 
we pretend, you know, we great pretenders. <laughs> we know all those ads you see on TV are a bunch of fakes. But you buy the stuff. Especially some of these ads that have, uh, ads that have the great scissors. Cuts everything from silk to steel. <laughs> of course, you never see them doing it, but go, <laughs> and you buy it. And what does it cut? You're lucky if it cuts paper. If you complain, they say, we didn't say it cut paper, it cuts steel. <laughs> How much steel do you have in your house? None. But are you, are you wise by that type? No. Mm -mm. They got a special frying pan next die that never burns. <laughs> never burns. What happens? You buy it again. And it burns. So we're, we're constantly doing, all they have to do is put new on something. It doesn't matter what it is new toothpaste, new tissue, new anything, and you buy it. You know it can't be that. What do they do? Dip it in something or what? It's not new tissue paper, tissue paper. It's not new. See, but we, we're accustomed. I mean, we're brought up with an element of dishonesty. We like integrity. And here is the most beautiful quality. And you begin to see men who did not recognize Jesus. It's like many of us don't recognize Jesus. And it was in failure. Now, that's another thing you all have to read about this. You read this by yourself sometime, 21st chapter of John. The, the, the apostles had to fail before they could see Jesus. In today's world, you're not allowed to fail. Isn't sin a failure? Huh? All sin is a failure. You see what they do to politicians? They, oh, you're rooting out somebody's past life. People could have done something 50 years ago, you know, and they're going to root it out and put it in the front line, see? Because they, they're not looking. See, they're not honest and they're not looking for goodness. And, and they don't believe. If there's one thing this whole world needs is God's mercy, don't you think? Huh? Mm -hmm. But is it merciful? I haven't seen it merciful yet. And that's because we're not honest. Honesty brings forth that quality of compassion. I'm not afraid to say I failed. And the biggest failure in the whole wide world, as far as the apostles were concerned at the crucifixion was Jesus. He failed. And the disciples going to Mayo said that, didn't it? We thought he was going to be our leader and deliver us from Rome. Well, never got the point. Was that failure? No, because it takes us a long time to get the point. And see, if you're honest, you see your sins. There's a great amount of dishonesty because our liberal brothers don't think you need to go to confession. Isn't that dishonest? Isn't that the big lie? Do you think burning your sins in some kind of a barrel is going to do it? You just wasted paper. I wouldn't write my sins on a piece of paper or give them to anybody. You say you don't want to confess your sins to a priest, but you write them on a piece of paper. How do you know they all got burned? Did you see the ashes? How do you know yours didn't flow up like this and land over there? Somebody pick it up and say, oh, I didn't know you did that. Isn't that all stupid? It's satanic. We don't want to admit to God. We don't want to say, I failed. 
So if you really want to begin to see Jesus in your life, you're going to have to become honest. I failed, Lord. I really did. And that's what Peter said. I know. If you want to call any time, go ahead. <laughs> I forgot to say that at the beginning. <laughs> so he said to them, throw the net out to stubborn side and you'll find something. Isn't that the wrong side of the boat? Anybody here boat? You got a boat? My fans don't have boats. <laughs> My fans are poor. Thank God. Well, there again comes something quality that maybe is a reason we don't see Jesus in our lives. Uh, we're not willing to do the ridiculous for Jesus. We do it here all the time. <laughs> That's why you see me on TV. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> a nun in this habit talking to you on TV. But see, that's what Jesus wants. That was a ridiculous thing for them to do. First of all, they were near shore, shallow water. There's no fish around shallow water. If they were, they'd go up and get them with their hands. They're coming into shore, close enough to see a man there he says, throw your net over here. Wrong side of the boat, wrong time of day, and wrong place. How many men here would have done that? Well, I'm glad you're not. It's you're not raising your hand because <laughs> you know you wouldn't have done that. You'd have said, who are you? Are you a fisherman? I'm a commercial fisherman, and I know when to catch fish, and there aren't any there, or I would have caught them. Isn't that what you'd say? Isn't that the defense mechanism that's in each one of us? I fail, but there's a reason for my failure. It's the fish. <laughs> the reason I flopped is not me, it's the fish. I went out the right time of day. I threw the net in the right place. I've been there all night. I'm wet. I'm cold. I don't want to fish. Men would say that. I don't know about women. Women just come in crying. <laughs> they come in crying, you know, like, oh, I didn't catch any fish. <laughs> See, men would have put on a big front. That's part of society today. If you haven't made it, don't let anybody know. But if we find out, we'll tell everybody. That's, isn't that the tenure of the day? See how false it is. It's very false. Now here again, first we get a real honest no, and now we see the apostles do what a stranger. Another thing we would have said, who are you? You ever fished before? You ever see fish? See, we would have, we would have resented somebody telling us to do what we couldn't do. See, that's why we don't see Jesus. That's why we don't see Jesus. We're not honest. We, we make excuses. What'd they do? They threw the net over. So they dropped the net, and there were so many fish, they could not haul it in. And the disciple Jesus loved. Of course, this is St. John writing this. See, you don't see the other evangelists saying that. Mm -hmm. John. In fact, I bet they were griped to death because he kept telling them that, you know. I'm the one they loved. <laughs> see, they were always arguing. Did you notice that in the scripture? Always, who was the greatest? I bet John caused that. <laughs> You young squirt, what do you know about it? <laughs> well, he loved me the most. That's because you're young. You're weak. You're a nothing. <laughs> we are the somebodies here. I am the greatest. You say, oh, yeah? 
Isn't that stupid? They're arguing like that all the time. And our dear Lord said, what, what are you talking about on the way? <laughs> oh. So he had to tell him, the greatest of you must be the least. So John here must have suffered a lot with that jealousy because he rubbed it in here. <laughs> the one that Jesus loved. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but this is the one Jesus loved. <laughs> Said to Peter, it is the Lord. Why did John recognize Jesus? before anybody else. Love. He loved Jesus. Totally. And Jesus was his all. He's the one that stood under the cross with Our Lady. He's the one that was there. When everybody left the Lord, there was John. Is that why we don't see Jesus? Is it because we don't want a Jesus on the cross? Have you noticed in all these modern churches, they, they took the, after the tabernacle, they took the crucifix out first, I think. They take the crucifix off, and then they took the, the cross out. So that's why I don't know what kind of Easter they had. They'd had a big bunny there. <laughs> Do you have a crucifix? Yeah, look at this one. I wanted to show it to you. How you like that, huh? Is that great? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you remember that uh, we always had um, a, uh, a crucifix here. I like to hold it. I hold it a lot. And um, then we put the monstrance on for our witness of love of the Eucharist because our dear Lord is so maligned in the Eucharist. And we got these for our, what we call profession. The sister doesn't get one of these until she's professed. And, and we put it on our side here to constantly remind us of not only his presence, see that's where sacramentals are so important, like sacred heart badges, huh? Your rosary in your pocket, um, holy water, all of these things are very, very important. Why? Because they're a constant reminder of his love for me. If I knew we understand he did this for me, then I would never be afraid to be honest, would I? I would never be afraid to, to confess my sins. I would never be uh, wondering about his mercy for me. If he went this far, he's going to be merciful to me. See? He's got to be merciful. And so as we get back to these, we, we find out that John recognized him. So now we know we need integrity, humility, and love. At these words, it is the Lord, Simon Peter, who had practically nothing on. Hmm. At these words, it is the Lord, he wrapped a cloak around him and jumped into the water. What a dumb thing to do. If you, you got a little bit on, why don't you just jump in the water? <laughs> Now, what does that teach us, huh? What it tells us is that here is a man who was forgiven for denying the Lord three times. Can you imagine that? Oh, we would have despaired because we don't have humility. Uh, Judas did. I heard a priest sometime one time tell me that don't be surprised if you see Jesus in heaven. I said, sweetheart, if you see Jesus when you die, I mean, if you see Judas when you die, I can tell you, you're not going to be in heaven either. Because <laughs> Jesus said, I have lost none except. And he said, have I not chosen you and one of you is a devil? Whoa. You better not believe all these people that don't believe in hell because they're going to lead you astray. Way astray. Now, 
He jumped into the water. That's zeal. He was so sure that Jesus had forgiven him. We would have been afraid. We would have kind of ducked down in the boat. Don't you think somebody had a duck down in that boat? You said, oh, I'm not worthy. I, I shouldn't do this. Mm -mm. And he was 100 yards from the land at 300 feet, huh? That's quite a ways. And this is cute. As soon as they came ashore, they saw there was some bread and a charcoal fire. I wonder where he got the charcoal. <laughs> With fish cooking on it. Do you realize God cooked breakfast for his unworthy apostles? If they would have, anybody did to me what they did to Jesus, copped out when he needed them the most, I wouldn't have made breakfast for him. I'd have done something else. <laughs> like pour charcoal on their heads or something. That's what I would have done. And he made breakfast. Isn't that so human? Here are these men. He knew they failed, but he filled their boat. Wouldn't that have been enough? But he knew they were hungry, cold, and he made breakfast. Mm. They dragged the net to shore. There's 153 fish. <sighs> well, we got a call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? I'm from Naples, Florida, sister. And where, what is your question? Well, I'd like to first thank you for this wonderful station and for you, Mother Angelica. Thank you. You have brought me back to the church. Thank you, Jesus. And what I would like to ask, I need prayer because I have been in a terrible sinful situation with a very abusive uh, second husband and at one time when I met him I was very prayerful and very active in the church this was about six years ago a Eucharistic minister and the church and the Blessed Mother and Jesus was my main object and I got my head turned thinking that this man loved me and he was he's an alcoholic and a drug person and it just, I pulled away from the church because I knew it was in sin being, living with somebody and being, finally marrying him, uh, and I wasn't in the church. And uh, I, last year, I, uh, my conscience started bothering me so bad that I started praying, and I found this station, and I started listening to you, and I started praying. And I had never really prayed the rosary because uh, I was a convert. And when I was a convert at that time, they didn't do it and they didn't teach me. Mm -hmm. But I just started saying it. And I would ask the Blessed Mother, and, and I know that she's done it, and it's got better each time. But uh, like my the priest that I counsel with, he says, Mary said, you're addicted to him like a person is to alcohol or and said, it's a very hard addiction to break. Mm -hmm. And what I would like, you have so many, many listeners, and I know that if you and your sisters, because I heard you say this one time, that if if we pray for what you ask, you better be sure that's what you want. And I want to be free from this person and from this sinful situation to go forward and to serve my Lord and to do what he wants to do and to bring more people to the church and that yeah. they would see that I'm trying to be a holy person and Christ-like well, once yeah, again. Well, yeah, you're, 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 not, you're not married to this person? Not now. I've got a divorce. Yeah. And are you alone? Yes, I'm alone now. I got a live-in housekeeping job, but it seems like every time things kind of go smooth and I'm I'm doing real good prayerful, he'll call me and there I'll run and I'll give bad, him money bad. or I'll help him. I know, but sweetheart, you you see, you're you're putting your entire eternity in, in in a very serious situation. So you don't don't do that. He's not worth giving up heaven and our dear Lord. See. Jesus must be enough for you. See, did Jesus pricked your conscience and made you realize you're in a very bad situation? See, don't let a little flattery get you. This man doesn't love you. He loves what you can give him. He doesn't love you. This one died for you. That one will do nothing for you. Now you're out of it, and, and you're free to go to church, you're free to pray, you're in a safe household. 
Don't give it up. Let's say Hail Mary for, huh? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Yeah, our God. Amen. You be as, you be at peace now because God is going to give you a, going to give you the grace, and we you need to be strong. Balance it. Just think of yourself: Am I going to endanger my eternal salvation? for this? See? Don't do that. Don't do that. Ask Our Lady to help you. See? Ask Our Lady to help you. She knows what you're going to miss. And don't allow anybody, any human being, to have the power over you to, to tear you away from Jesus. Okay? And my sisters and I will pray for you when we thank you. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hi, where are you from? I'm calling from California. And what is your question? Well, my question basically is, how do you respond to something I'm going to tell you about? So I better tell you. What's this? I said, I, my question is, how do you respond to something I'm going to tell you about? So I better tell you Depends first. on what you're going to tell me. Right, okay. <laughs> I have in front of me uh, the Palm Sunday bulletin from our church. There's a question and answer column here, a short one, reprinted from a well-known Catholic newspaper. Yeah. The first question is, can non-Catholics receive sacramentals? Sacramentals? Sacramentals. Oh, yeah. Why not? The answer is, yes, generally speaking, persons not of the Catholic faith who respect our religion are able to receive all the sacramentals of the church unless they are positively excluded for some serious reason. Now, you know what a sacramental is. Maybe I'm misinterpreting. Yeah, you are. I'll make a bet. Okay. Okay. I don't think I want to bet against you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. A sacramental is holy water. You know, you go into Catholic Church, have a, a bowl of holy water. It's got a blessed salt in it. and It's been specially blessed. It's very powerful. The demons don't like it at all. You dip your hand in. You can do that. You can wear a sacred heart badge. I wish I had one in my pocket. Ah, I got something else. I think. I put it in there today. Mm. If I can find it. There you go. Okay. Um, this is sacramental. It's a five scapular. I know if you're going to wear it, do it all. You know what I mean? <laughs> I need all the help I can get. So I got this. I put it on my, I'm going to wear it. Okay, here's a, here is a beautiful medal of St. Benedict, very powerful against the enemy. This is a little cruise. This is a little cross that you wear, see? Now, this is a sacramental. It's a, it's a, a, um, a scapular. In fact, there's five here. And they all, they all have been promised different things, you see? Here's the white one, the Trinitarian. Here's the blue, the uh, Immaculate Heart. Boy, somebody help me. Here's a um, here's a brown for uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Here's the black for the Passion, and here's one for the Precious Blood. So I figure if all of them help to get to heaven, I did all five. <laughs> and I just bought one for this chastisement. I can't show it to you because I'm wearing it. <laughs> Next week up. But these are sacramentals. See, these are sacramentals. And they have a great power to them in his mind. It's not superstitious stuff. We're not talking about that. We're talking about power uh, against the invisible any, uh, enemy. Or you can wear one. I would, anybody got a Sacred Heart badge here? You heathens. <laughs> <laughs> You got one. Maybe you can't let me see it. Okay, bring it over here. There we go. Thank you. This also is a sacramental. It's, it's a reminder. People say we're kind of, uh, you know, always worshiping things. I thought we're worshiping things. Why you wear, if I let you, uh, you, you to give me your wallet, well, not everything in it, but um, you would have a picture of your wife, your grandchildren in there, right? 
Well, you're not worshiping. There, you got one there. You got one. This is a sacramental. When you, when you see it, when you touch it, it's a reminder of the love of Jesus. See, there's Jesus on this side and the heart of Jesus on that side. Anybody can have a sacramental, but you cannot have sacraments. Do you understand the difference? Mm -hmm. A sacramental is this. A sacrament, Eucharist, <coughs> baptism, all of these things in the church, most especially Eucharist and confession, a non-Catholic is not open to. Why? Because you are not part of the body of the church and you don't believe in the real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity. See, where's Danny's camera? I don't know where Danny is. Where's Danny's camera? Oh, here you are. Okay, I'll show you that again. Here's a sacramental here. Here's a scapular. You wear it. See, this is, you wear it like this. Well, like this, see? Not on top of your veil, but kind of itchy, but that's okay. It's better than hell. <laughs> okay, so this is, the, you can wear these, and that was right. What, you, what they told you, here, I don't want to steal the sacred heart badge. Thank you, hon. Um, but that's right. We have another, another call. Hello? Uh, hello, Mother Angelica. Hi. What kind of, where are you from? Uh, Connecticut. And what is your question? Um, Mother Angelica, Easter Sunday, I watched um, a movie, King of Kings, um, about Jesus. Uh -huh. And in the movie, he was on the mountain and he said, um, we all have the, t the kingdom of God within us. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, you are made to the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? It means you can think, you can remember, you can recall. Uh, it means you can understand and you can accomplish will. Do you have a memory, intellect, and will? So you're made in the image of God. Otherwise, you'd be a stupid animal. I mean, of all the animals, we're the dumbest. When you're born, you got to take care of you how long? The law says you got to be 21 years old. Can you imagine a rabbit having to be 21 <laughs> before he can go and eat something, huh? Or a deer or a bear? We used to have goats and sheep. And, and those little sheep were just out of its mother and bingo, knew just where to go. Was blind as a bat. Well, you get a baby, he's just there. And what is he, three, four, before he gets to use the reason? I was three, because I told my grandmother to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it at the time. <laughs> so you see what happens is that we, we, we're uh, uh, animal-like, we're, we're dumb. Dab, dab, dab. But we're made to the image and likeness of God, so that makes me superior to all the animals. Now, when we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is within you, we're talking about baptism, where I receive. Now, the liberals say you, you joined the club. What a stupid thing to say. I could join a lion's club, but don't take away original sin. See, joining a club don't take away anything. But anyway, I become then the presence. We're, talking, we're going to talk about the presence of God. Not just imaginary, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call this divine indwelling. Lives in me from that point. From that point, <coughs> lives in me. And so the kingdom of heaven is in me. Where is, what is the kingdom of heaven? God is the kingdom of heaven. What makes heaven is God. So I carry around with me the Lord God. If I'm in a state of grace, St. Paul said, do you know that, that the spirit of the Lord lives in you? 
See, he said, if you don't know that, you failed the test. So that's what we mean, that the kingdom of heaven is within. And you know, you live in that kingdom, and you can tell, can't you? Some people live in hell. Some people live in purgatory in their heart, and some people live in heaven. It doesn't mean they don't have any problems. But it means when you know Jesus, when you are aware of Jesus, and you know his life, and you know his suffering, and you know what he did for you, and you know he loves you, you're able to accept anything. I don't care what it is. That's as close to heaven as you get. We've had some people here for Easter, and they said, Mother, going to the services and going to Easter Sunday Mass was to us as close to heaven as we'll get. But when you accept the truth of the church, and you love the church, you love Jesus, and you believe in everything the church teaches, you have a kind of peace. Oh, you can't explain things sometimes, but that's not, that's not important. So we have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Um, from St. Martinville, Louisiana Mother. And my what is your question? My name is Ron, and my question is, um, how does, uh, I would like you to tell us how to do uh, an examination of conscience uh, in detail. Uh, a couple of weeks of go a couple of weeks ago, we have very good priests uh, here, and uh, we're fortunate. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the um, Father Bienvenu's homily, um, he said, uh, people come in and they tell me, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't curse. I, he said, I don't want to know that. I want to know your sins. Mm. And I find that... Um, People, uh, even even I have trouble um, uh, um, pinning down precisely what it is that my sins are, and um, I, I wondered if you could uh, explain to us in detail and give us. Well, a I could give you detail for the simple reason that we'd have to be here another two hours, and I don't want to make you scrupulous now. But uh, if you follow the commandments and examine yourself on the commandments, that's a good beginning. Uh, secondly, examine yourself on the new commandment also. Not instead of the ten, but the new one. How much do I love my neighbor? For example, do I gossip about my neighbor? Do I uh, slander my neighbor? What does slander mean? Well, slander means that I say something about my neighbor or I say something to you about someone nobody ever knew. See what I mean? You get that in a newspaper all along. Every day they slander somebody. Say you knew that somebody committed adultery 20 years ago. Now, nobody knows it but you. And you go and say, did you know that so-and-so committed a deli 20 years ago? Is it true? Yes. But it's slander. Why? Because you ruined a reputation. You told something you alone knew that was long gone, long forgiven. And it's a true statement, but you slandered them. Now, a lot of people calumniate, and they just make up lies about people to ruin their reputation. See? That's a lack of love. Are you harsh? We're going to start with love. I could be here all night if you want to examine your conscience. Uh, do you really love your wife or your, your children? You say, yeah, I love them. I only beat them up once a week. <laughs> well, maybe they need a swat in the back, but um, are you patient with them? So, do you go to confession and say, I'm very impatient? And I'm cruel sometimes to my wife and my children. Who cares whether you smoke or not? You're just, that's stupidity. It's not a sin. <laughs> you, you don't go to confession and, and accuse yourself of stupid things. I ate too many potato chips. See, when you commit a sin, you know it. 
That's why a lot of sins committed in the dark. Well, you think you're fooling. You think God's blind? There's no darkness with him. Have you stolen anything? So I haven't stolen a thing in my whole life. Well, what about your income tax? <laughs> Are you honest? Did you go and work for somebody who gave you $20, but did you declare it? No. That's mine. Okay, it's yours. I went to the store and there was a package of uh, chewing gum on the floor and a steak fell out of the meat case. <laughs> a steak fell out of the meat case? Yeah, that I thought nobody's going to want it, so I, I took it. Put it under my sweater. Ooh, that must have smelled good. <laughs> See, we, we're so accustomed to lying and cheating that we don't ever tell those things in confession. You say, I lie a little bit. What's a little bit? I tell white lies. What's a white lie? Have you really coveted your neighbor's wife? Do you know what the Lord said? If you lust after a woman in your mind, whoa, You've already committed adultery. Now that's the Lord talking, not some little old nun. Now men will say, well, I'm human. Who's questioning that? You don't look like an ape. <laughs> you may act like an ape, but you don't look like one. So that's another sin. You, see, you read pornographic books or something. So well, I can handle it. Well, if you could handle it, you wouldn't be reading it. If you had any brains, that's a better way of saying it. See, there's a lot of things that you could do, or you do do. You walk slow in front of an X-rated movie. Well, I didn't go in. <laughs> you probably had more thoughts than are in there. <laughs> My wife worked hard all day, and uh, I came home, and I was irritable and irritating. I didn't like the food she cooked, and I hurt her feelings, and she cried. Is that wrong? Yeah, it's wrong. It means you're cold, lacking in compassion. So there are many things. Also, you might examine your motives. Now, that's a goodie. You see? Why do you do the things you do? Do you ever wonder about that? I was angry. Okay, well, sometimes there's justified anger, isn't there? Well, you get angry over movies like The Last Temptation of Christ. <sighs> see? Uh, it's not scruples. Not at all. It's just an honest evaluation. I'm angry because... <laughs> I'm proud. Oh, now we're getting down to roots, see? Why are you proud? No, it's just me. I think I'm the best. Well, we could have told you that long ago. If you're having a problem with an examination of conscience, ask your neighbor or your wife. They'll tell you things you never <laughs> knew. You need to watch, though, that you don't get scrupulous, that you don't question God's mercy. But see, here's Peter. What an example Peter is. A plain no, I failed. That's all. He didn't excuse himself. I think you're right. We all need to examine our conscience. We do it once a day. You say, well, what do you got to say, Mother? Quite a bit, depending on the day. But you see, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We want to be like Jesus, but we're not perfect. We have another call. Hello? Good evening, Mother. Good evening. Where are you from? Good Easter to you. I'm Thank from you. Minnesota. It's so wonderful to see you again. You're really you. part of our family. We really missed you all last week. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when you were in the beginning of the show and you were reading about Peter, 
and how the apostles kind of went out fishing. Yes. I always, um, I felt like um, you did at first. I thought, well, yeah, that's kind of a dumb thing to do. But then now as I've gotten older, and I, I belong to a good parish, a spiritual parish. But, Thank God. Um, most of the people, it seems like, are laboring under like an anxiety. Um, like both parents work. Because oh, yeah. they're always afraid they're not going to have enough, or one of them might lose their job, or they won't be able to afford their kids' tuition. In other words, um, a lot of times people seem so wrapped up in just their material existence that we seem like Peter. We know Christ is risen, but we don't even know he's with us because we're so wrapped up in, i got to do this and i got to do that. If I don't, something bad will happen. And so I, we were, um, I belonged to a prayer group, and we were discussing this. All of us women are at home with our children, and we were talking about how in the parish everybody's too busy, too busy to pray, too busy to, to go to devotions, too busy. And we, a lot of us were thinking that a lot of people say, well, how can I trust God in the way that the gospel says we should? Yeah, you know, he the only way, he's the only one you can really trust totally. We trust each other, but the human hope is so different than supernatural hope. You, 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 you go out and you say, well, I hope he does that. <laughs> You've already admitted you don't think he is. <laughs> I hope you do this. Uh, the reason is we've become so materialistic, and, and the, the media does helps that a lot. The media always thinks you don't have enough. It's a bigger car. It has more gadgets. Uh, uh, you could have more gourmet food. You could do this. You could do that. And it, there's a feeling of kind of hopelessness. You're running a rat race that has no end. Uh, there is a, a hunger in man's mind, a heart. And if he's not fed by the church, this is where our liberal brother is going to have to suffer an awful lot. And this isn't old-fashioned religion either. It's the honest truth. Because you've taken away hope. You've given false values to the people, or no values at all. When you've taken away their churches, their sacraments, their holy water, replaced it with sand, their crucifixes, replaced it with, with a banner, their marvelous churches, and you put up gymnasiums. Well, you took all of that away from them. You lost, uh, you made them lose hope. And so the only thing they have left is things, more things, more boats, more cars, more everything. And they're scared to death of losing them. But see, when you know God and you know the truth and you know Jesus, you know that you might lose them one day. I can tell you when you die, you're going to lose it all like that. See, that's not, the values are bad. Because for years you haven't been taught the truth. You, you've been taught a false doctrine. And so you're afraid of suffering because they don't believe in the suffering Jesus. That's why they took him down from the cross. They do today what the Pharisees said, if you are the Christ, come down and we'll believe you. So you bought a bad doctrine, you bought a bad, a bad, you bought a lie. And once you buy a lie, there's no hope in your life, no hope. Somebody said the uh, postulant uh, aspirant came not too long ago, said she went looking at this um, convent that she wanted to enter monastery, or not monastery, but mother house. And she went into the chapel and there was a blessed sacrament on the right and Buddha on the left. See, how, how can you live and teach a lie? If you want to live a lie, that's something, but if, why teach a lie? And you'll notice that most of the people who are living like that and grasping and grabbing and grabbing and grabbing and fearful, they don't know the truth. They don't know the church. They don't know Jesus. See, if, you're, if you know Jesus, you're willing to have it or lose it. See, that's why the Christians lost everything. To become a Christian in the beginning was a, taken for granted you're going to lose it all. You didn't have it. I mean, they, they sent you out to the alliance. For the first 300 years, every pope, every bishop was, was martyred. Today, you change your religion if somebody looks crooked at you. 
And that's why they follow all the New Age and the Enneagrams and all the lies that have been told by some priests and some religious. They're good priests and religious. But you'll notice, and what these people need is Jesus. The stock market goes down two or three days. You're panicky. <laughs> I think that's a riot. <laughs> it shows you where your God is. And he's, he's moving. <laughs> your God is moving up and down. That's why you're panicky, sister. Who is your God? What's his name? Dow Jones? A movie house? Four Roses? Said, how does mother know about Four Roses? <laughs> My uncle used to sell the stuff. <laughs> I come from a long family. Not a boozers. They never saw it. They were never drunk. They just sold it. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, if that's your God, you're going to see a lot of people shake one of these days. A lot of people. Make Jesus and realize that Jesus is your Lord, and here's his book. The church is his great interpreter. The church tells you what everything in this book is in it. It tells you all the revelations of the Lord. He is risen. Hallelujah. He rose in the flesh. Hallelujah. So, remember, you are an heir to the kingdom. And it doesn't matter if you have a boat or not. Stay home, take care of your kids. Better to eat beans and have a happy family than run around all your cars and be miserable. Well, I love you, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now. To order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Happy Easter, family. The days from Easter Sunday through Divine Mercy Sunday, known as the Easter Octave, are the most joyful days of the year. It is when we celebrate the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the emotions that the women and the disciples felt at the tomb? Initially, they were confused and dejected, but this was soon replaced with thanksgiving as they witnessed history's greatest event. Jesus turned the profound grief into utter joy. If we are ever tempted to despair in our own lives, just remember that God himself opened the gates of heaven for us. No matter the problems we face, no matter the state of the world, we should not fear. As we celebrate the resurrection, let us remember that we meet our Savior many ways. We encounter the risen Lord every time that two or three are gathered. We encounter him in sacred scripture, and we especially encounter him in the most blessed sacrament. He is here for us every moment out of love for us. This is a reason to rejoice. He is risen indeed. As Pope St. John Paul II proclaimed years ago, we are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song. May God bless you. For more information on the Easter octave, please visit EWTN.com forward slash Easter. St. Faustina delivered the Divine Mercy message to the world. Mercy is when love encounters suffering. 
and takes action to do something about it. Learn how to receive the extraordinary graces Jesus is offering you.